So we have looked into the um, Diffie-Hellman key exchange and we also looked into Algamon encryption signatures and what all of these problems have in common is that they get broken if the attacker can solve the discrete logarithm. So if the attacker can take Alice's public key, which is g to the a, and recover a from knowing well, the public key and the generator g. And we've now seen one attack, namely the baby step giant step attack, in order to compute discrete logarithms. To recap on the, on the runtime of this algorithm, there was this parameter m, which is chosen about the square root of the group order, and then you need m baby steps, then you have an extra multiplication for the inversion part, and then you have up to m plus 1 of the giant steps. Now, each of those steps is just the multiplication. So this is, looks like an exponentiation because you're writing g to the i and s to the j. But because you know the g to the i minus 1, getting to g to the i is just a multiplication by g. And also for the s, you do one inversion, so you don't have to compute it each and every time. A downside of the baby step giant step attack is that you require storage for the m group elements. Um, so you have about as much storage as the runtime. And it is a lot harder on an algorithm if it has storage requirements than it has time requirements. Time requirements you can typically just wait for longer, whereas for storage requirements you are ab either able to store it or you're not. A nice feature of the baby step giant step attack is that it didn't require any special properties of this group. So we didn't use that this was the multiplicative group of a fine field. This would work in any group. So you have some g, you take the group operation, we've written this multiplicatively, so you have a g to the a, but if it's written additively, it's a times g. Now, of course, for some groups, as we've seen in the exercises, it's much easier to break this. So if you have the additive group of a fine field, then it's as simple as an inversion, but for any group, you can always break it with a baby step giant step attack. And coming back to the cost estimates, so this m was the square root of the group order, and so any discrete logarithm in any group can be broken in times square root of g. Now this big O is the complexity class of the square root of g, so this ignores all constants and it also ignores all lower order terms, so I don't have to worry about this m being the floor or the ceiling of the square root of g. That all disappears into the, into the big O. Also, you could see on the previous line that I'm saying that this is a cyclic group, but that is not a restriction, because the moment that you're looking at a discrete logarithm problem, you have one generator g, and you have a power of g. These elements might be living in a much larger group, which is non-cyclic, but the um, discrete logarithm problem just gets the powers of g. So it gets g, g squared, g to e, and so on, until we reach the power of g, which is equal to 1, and then to g again. So we are naturally in a cycle there. And that is also the, the size of the cycle is the order of g that we're talking about in the next line, in the complexity. We like groups where that's also the best attack. I mean, we can't do better as a designer, we can't do any, get any group which is stronger than this, and so we would like to have a group which is not weaker. And such groups, from all we know, do exist in the form of elliptic curves. So elliptic curve cryptography was proposed in 1985 and has now stood up for 35 years, uh, still in the interesting cases being full cost complexity, so square root of the group order. We can avoid the storage cost. So in baby step giant step, you need storage for as many elements as the baby steps. Paul Joe is a method which avoids that, but it's conceptually more complicated. So for this course, we just covered in baby step giant step, and it still says, well, look, um, your algorithm is broken if anybody can do that many operations. And then it's interesting to know that you can't rely on the storage being the, the bottleneck. Both of those are covered in the master's course. They're not covered here, so stay until next year if you want to learn about this. What we're looking at here is not the best case. So elliptic curves would have the full square root of the group order complexity for fine fields, whether it's prime fields like Fp or extension fields Fp to n, there are stronger attacks. So the strongest one is called index calculus, which exists in number field sieve and function field sieve varieties, depending on whether in your FP case 
or a p to the n, like the most extreme case would be a power of two fine field um, for those much much stronger attacks exist than for the prime fields, but all of those have sub exponential complexity, actually very similar to the attack cost of factoring. So similar to RSA, where you want at least 3000 bits, and if you're better with 4000 bits, you also here want to show that your prime has that many bits. And I'm writing P in particular, you could have with a small extension degree, P to the N, something somewhat larger than 3072. But if you don't have any reasons for going for extension fields, stick with the prime fields. They are more, more secure and easier. Now, this discrete log problem wasn't the only one which was related to the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It also gets broken if anybody, if any attacker can take Alice's share, the g to the a, and Bob's share, the g to the b, and combine them into the Diffie-Hellman share, g to the a, b. So that was the computational Diffie-Hellman problem. And there are not really any attacks known that are stronger than solving the discrete log problem. Of course, if you can solve discrete logs, you can break the CDHP, but it could be a lot easier. There are some proofs that you that relate the hardness of breaking one to the breaking the other, so you can compute the computation of the Hellman um, several times, um, and then you can break the discrete log of the same group. However, this requires several, and the several depends on this on the group that is chosen, on the size of the group, on the order of the group, and it can be quite a few. It can be so many that there can be a real difference in the complexity class. So it is not tightly coupled. I mean, if CDH is trivial to break, then DLP will also be trivial to break. But if it has some cost, then the DLP could still be strong. Now, that does not hold for the decisional dp Hammer problem. So the decisional dp Hammer problem was you get the generator and then Alice's and Bob's shares, and you get a third value that's called D for decision, which is some power of g, so it's something g to the c, and you are supposed to decide whether g to the c is equal to their shared key. Well, it is or it's not, um, but it's just a decision, it's not a computation, so you have 50-50 chance of saying yes or no. Now, for that one, it depends on the group how hard this is. So let's look at an example that we've been doing the whole time, namely the find field fp and then the multiplicative group of it. So the whole order. So this g is a generator, it's a primitive element, that means it has order p minus 1. Now note in particular that p is a large prime, so p minus 1 is even. And so first of all, p minus 1 over 2 is an integer, so we can compute the p minus 1 over 2 to power. And that allows us to check without knowing them whether a, b, or c are even. So let's look at this case for a. So we're looking at Alice's public key, which is g to the a, and then we want to figure out whether a is even. Now an even number you can always write as two times some other number, so that's the first row there, and an odd number, well, it is not two times something, so it's two times something plus one. So let's trace first the case that it's an even number. And if we compute this g to the a to that power, and I'm now replacing a by 2 a prime because I'm tracing the even case first, then those two twos cancel, and I'm left with g to the a prime times p minus 1. I can change the order, I have the g to the p minus 1 in parentheses, and then to the a prime. Now, that one we all know from Fermat's little theorem, g to the a p minus 1 is 1. Multiply. And so we're looking at 1 to the power a prime, which obviously is 1. Okay, so it is definitely 1 if a is even. Now if a is odd, then we have the same starting point except for there is a plus 1. And the plus 1 gets multiplied by p minus 1 over 2. So we're looking at g to the p minus 1 over 2. Now we know we know a little bit about this now. We know g is a generator, so we know that g to the p minus 1 is 1, that's it for every other number, but we also know that this cycle that we're looking at, well, g is a generator of it, so before we hit p minus 1, we have not come back to 1. 
So we're starting with g to the 0, g, g squared, and so on. And then the first time we're hitting 1 is after a full cycle, after p minus 1 steps. And so g to the p minus 1, when we square it, gives us 1, whereas it is itself not a square. And we're working in modulo p, which is a prime. So there are only two square roots of plus 1. Well, there's plus 1 and there's minus 1. And minus 1 modulo p means p minus 1. So that is the second row here. Okay, so yes, we can do this computation. G, the a value, so h sub a is public, that's Alice's public key. And p is public, so we can compute h to the p minus 1 over 2, and then just look what the value is. All right, now let's turn this into an attack. So we need to do some more tracing of numbers. Now, if you multiply two integers and say one is even, then you have a 2 times a prime times b. And now it doesn't matter what the b is, there's a 2 there. So you have now 2 times a prime b. This is again an even number. Or if a is odd and b is even, there's a 2 from the b part. So if you multiply a and b and at least one of, at least one of them is even, then also their product is even. And now it's one more step to argue that you are reducing modulo an even number. So you take an even a times b, and you're reducing modulo something which is even itself. Then p minus 1 is even because p is odd. Now, you have seen the Chinese remainder theorem. So you can split the modulo p minus 1 in a part which is all the even parts and in the part which is all the odd parts. And so this a times b is a unique value which keeps, well, has to have the same evenness here because it's modulo of something which is even. So if it's 0 mod 2, the result after reduction mod p minus 1 remains even. Now similarly, um, if both a and b are odd, then a times b is odd as an integer, and also the reduction modulo p minus 1 is odd. Okay, so if c is a random value, then c is randomly chosen to be odd or even. So it might not match the parity, the odd evenness of a times b. So I can just compute um, what a and b are, and if both of them, or at least one of them, is even, then also their product is even. And if I then find that, g, that c is odd, then I've detected a case that this is not the decision. I mean, this is not a valid determinant. Now, at least one of them being even, 50% here, 50% there, so in total, three quarters of all cases have at least one of them being even. And in that case, we have a 50-50 chance of being in the case that c is odd. And then we detect that this is not a valid triple. Alternatively, both of them are even, uh, both of them are odd. That happens with one quarter probability. And then, well, if it's even, we do detect this is not a valid triple. And if it's odd, we can't detect it. So as an attacker, we would now say, okay, we will use our distinguisher. If this gives a valid parity condition, so if a, B, and C, A times B and C are all even, or if all of them are odd, then we assume that it's a valid triple. So that means we're getting 100% of all valid cases, and we're getting 50% of the invalid cases. We get those wrong. So we get those all right, and 50% of those we get wrong. And the other 50% of the non-valid triple, we win, which means we have a three-quarters chance of winning, which is much, much, much larger than one half. We normally want to have something negligible in order to say it's secure, so one half plus an epsilon and the epsilon disappears to zero. Now this is one half plus a quarter, that's a huge constant. So this is a gigantic advantage of the attack. So let's see this in practice. Let's go back to the example field that we also had for the baby step giant step attack. So again, we're working in F53 and we have a generator being two. And Alice has key 33, Bob has 25, and we're given this value d. So, well, 
Maybe three is their shared secret, or maybe three is just some random power of two. Let's see. So let's start with looking what A is in terms of even or odd. And so we're supposed to multiply uh, to um, raise this to the power of p minus 1 over 2. Now p is 53, so p minus 1 over 2 is 26. And we compute this and we get 52. Now that's p minus 1, and so that means that a is an odd number. Let's look at c. So we're taking this decisional value d, which is 3, to the power of 26. And again, this gets 52. So those two things are compatible. So A is odd, C is odd, if now B is also odd, then it may or may not be a valid term. Of course, you can guess already how I constructed this example. So yes, if I look at the bub, um, public key of Bob, which is 25 to the 26, then I'm getting 1. So that means B is even. And if A is odd, B is even. That means A times B mod P minus 1 is even. And so we learn that this is not a valid term. So in this case, we have broken the decision to be harmonic problem with just three exponentiations. Now, bear in mind that we are here in a case where we're using the full fine field. We're not going for a subgroup. And I had already motivated that we would want to work in subgroups which are much smaller, like in prime order subgroups. And here you get, you get a glimpse of why this should be desirable. So in, in general, we do want to work in a subgroup which has some large prime order. So, well, if our field is just um, integers mod 53, the largest subgroup that I can find is the integer is order 13, which is prime. And so we will be taking um, g to the 4 in order to get an element which has order 13. And that then would be a prime order. And then this argument doesn't hold anymore because 13 is prime, it changes between odd and even numbers. So if you're taking 2 times 8, well, both of these are even, you're getting 16, which reduces to 3 modulo 13. So because you're reducing modulo an odd number, you're changing the parity. So this decisional Diffie-Hellman problem, this attack on it, is only broken because we're not working in prime order groups, and we have this very simple factor of 2, which allows us to distinguish between even and odd. Now, if you, if you work this out, you can, of course, if you find a factor of 3 in your group order, you can devise a similar oracle, which then, okay, one of the three cases will match and the other two cases will not match. And so you can get different probabilities for each of the factors. So more reasons that you would want to have a prime order.